thank you for joining us today with this. We will have a talk by Mei Ling that will be followed by a workshop um, that where we will be making the tiles that Mei Ling designed, which will ultimately go upstairs in our yet to be finished space. So thank you so much, Mei Ling. Welcome. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> Hi, Brenda. Hi, everyone. So nice to see you all. It wasn't too long ago that Troy was my home and RPI was my world in terms of work. <laughs> um, but it's nice to see you all regardless. And um, thank you so much, Danielle, for, for doing this workshop, even though I won't be there in, in, in person to see how it turns out. I'm sure the photos and just text messages from, from Kathy might give me just a glimpse of how it went. Um, so I wanted to share with you guys today some of my work. Um, and, and it's quite informal. I, I Please feel free to jump in at any point in time, um, particularly if you have questions or comments. Um, so just give me one second. So funny. Okay, great, okay. Okay. So um, over the past uh, decade, I've sort of been working at the intersection of the building, the agricultural and the food material life cycles. Um, this very much began when I was at RPI and I sort of had a crisis when I was working, um, doing my PhD at the Center for Architecture, Science and Ecology. And we were working on some really high tech dynamic systems for buildings. And I realized all of a sudden that nothing I was working on would ever make its way to where I came from. And what's more, even if it did, it would be a luxury sort of project. And so I sort of made a decision in my second year of my PhD to um, work with a material stream that has been in abundance uh, where I come from for centuries Africa has exported low value agricultural goods abroad and um, the, the remnants of that has been waste um, all across agricultural enterprises on the continent. And so that journey really began by looking at materials coming out of agriculture and making its way into our buildings um, through upcycling. And over time, I you know, realized that the missing link was the materials that made its way onto our plate um, and all of the ways in which, um, and the quantities of waste that come out of that cycle, not necessarily being super efficient. Um, for me, the building you know, was such an important place to begin. Um, if we look at the way in which energy is consumed in our world, buildings, form the primary um, consumer of energy, um, about 40% ahead of transport, ahead of industry. And what's interesting is if you break that 40% down, you'll realize that only 20% of that energy is spent on processing and constructing buildings. But the longer period of the building's lifetime, we spend all of our energy maintaining and operating it. And so for me, I was very interested in understanding how materials first of all, could um, uh, uh, employ underutilized material streams like the ones coming out of agriculture, but how also they could not be passive, that they weren't designed from the, um, um, you know, sort of devoid of participating in the building's operational and maintenance regimes. <clears throat> and so everything to do with breathable material systems, materials that actually improve the air quality instead of leaving all of that responsibility up to our mechanical systems. Um, and I also realized it was very much a question of quality of life, not just quantitative energy. It was also about the fact that we spend probably now, you know, post uh, COVID pandemic era, we spend over 90% of our time indoors. And so we're consistently surrounded by materials that play a disproportionate impact on our health and well-being. And that just, you know, sort of extends from, um, sorry, sorry, there's a lot of noise behind me, forgive me. Um, that also plays a, a longer impact if we look beyond just when the buildings are surrounding us in our buildings 
but all the way from when they leave the ground, when they're produced. So it's a much longer life cycle than one realizes. Um, so we've seen the shift in a number of proactive material streams and standards that are um, basically helping us figure out how to reduce the amount of energy that goes into producing materials that has also a cumulative effect in terms of what comes out of that. Um, we see sort of the design of material systems that play a, a role in reducing the energy load in buildings. And most importantly, we see the elimination of all of these toxic chemicals and pollutants that have found their way into our building materials. So it's in that spirit of this proactive movement that a lot of the work that I've been doing is embracing. Um, by and large, you know, we can understand the way we've typically built um, and the, our relationship with materials through this sort of diagram, the horseshoe on the left, um, which is a sort of paradigm, material paradigm, where we spend so much energy extracting materials from our ground, treating it um, with heat and a lot of toxic materials, using lots of energy, transporting it across longer and longer distances, where they sort of end up in our buildings. And I'm sure Nature Lab and everyone who's built there knows this process. Like, you know, it's, it's so expensive. And we also don't know all of the, the ecologies that we're destroying or affecting in the process of constructing our, our materials and our buildings. Um, and by and large, they sit within our buildings where they don't necessarily play a role within the energy and, and quality of life that we surround ourselves with spend a lot of energy maintaining the kind of thermal environments that we so desire now. And they form huge sort of waste problems. And so I shift from that model, the horse to something that's more cyclical um, where one would be able to source materials that are coming out of other interconnected life cycles, be, being able to look around us instead of just ahead and take that as a resource <clears throat> to drive new types of building material systems. And so I found myself kind of a border of academia and industry, um, looking for opportunities to take um, these wastes and through three different scales, the material, um, which is mostly done in labs and in studios in collaboration with other institutions, um, the module scale, which very much happens at the scale of the studio, and this has primarily happened at RPI, um, and then actually deploying them somewhere um, in the, in, on a building scale. So for me, this is so important because I think often the actual experience, all of the problems that we realize that are barriers to changing our adoption to these materials um, can't happen unless people actually can relate to it on a one-to-one -one scale. And so um, research test beds, as well as you know, opportunities like this, like at the Sanctuary for Independent Media, or a number of art exhibitions are a very important way for me to engage with the public and a much wider audience. <laughs> I should mention that you know, the inspiration for most of my work has really come from Ghana, um, from an, um, an artist called Ella Natsui, who um, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s began experimenting, working with a lot of waste from commodity products. And so in this you know, piece of art, one of my favorites, he basically takes the lid or the caps of bottles and flattens them out in order to construct these hanging sculptures and transforms the value of something that is completely discarded. In fact, we don't really have uses for them, so they're, they're waste, and actually gives them a new life. Um, and these pieces today sell for over a million dollars. So in terms of return and, and the ecosystem that Ellen Natsui has built around his work, um, the profits from that are shared very um, uniformly along, along anyone whose hand has touched and constructed some of his works. And his work has influenced a generation of, of peers, of collaborators in Ghana. Ibrahim Mahama works with hemp sacks. Um, you know, hemp sacks that have been carriers for agricultural waste over multiple cycles. Often they carry very clean agricultural products like rice. And over their time, they're recycled for onions and other low value um, or lower value agricultural crops. On the right is work using the gallon. So the plastic gallons that are typically used to carry oil. 
And this is very commonly used in um, uh, cooking and energy, um, for cooking and energy in, in parts of the city that aren't connected to the grid. And so that symbolic use of this um, infrastructure, um, sort of kitchenware or houseware is reconstructed as art. So inspiration very much came from home, but my work started to look at renewable biopolymers and, and there's just an infinite number of sources that we can tap into to activate um, a very different material stream. Um, I Most of my work has been concentrated around lignocellulosic products. So these are stuff that are very much associated with agricultural waste. And obviously through um, working with some of the mycelium technologies that have come out of companies, particularly one um, in Troy, Ecovative, um, I started to also engage with that. So um, I'm happy to share a few projects. Um, and if there are any questions, please, you know, just jump right in. Um, agricultural waste was such an important place to begin, um, mainly because of the sheer scale at which we're generating it. And it's very much tied to our growth as a human species. The more we grow, the more food we need to eat. And, and that also drives this huge production of material waste. So we knew that about 10 years ago, we were producing about a billion megagrams of, of materials just for food. And it's kind of crazy to think that only a third finds its way onto our plates. And a much larger percentage is actually either prematurely downcycled or burnt in open air. So we haven't developed the mechanisms for being patient and for finding out what these wastes are used or could be used for um, before they are ready to return back to the ground. Um, and looking at you know, all of the largest sources of agricultural wastes or agricultural byproducts, um, we, I sort of started off looking at the waste from coconut um, and it isn't by and large the most widely available or the most widely produced, but what was interesting about it was um, the fact that if you break down the husk, which is the waste byproduct, it had a really high percentage of some really strong fibers, the lignin components, and had very little sugar. So it lent itself to a, a whole range of interesting applications, particularly for buildings. Um, the other thing is coconut is sort of in the hands of farmers all along the tropical equator that make less than a dollar a day. And so the fact that we might turn what was a waste problem in their backyards into an opportunity for generating revenue was also a huge driver for, for the work. So it was through the coconut that I had my first encounter with mycelium. Um, I was sort of researching, um, you know, taking that waste, as you can see over here, a lot of coconuts are drunk um, in cities. Um, this is also part of a global trend. Coconut is the new superfood. Um, everything coconut butter, coconut oil. I sound like the, the guy and the shrimp guy in, in Forrest Gump. It's just, it never ends, the coconut uses. But that is a very common scene, as you can see over there on the streets of Accra, Ghana's capital, where you have just piles of coconut husk um, produced daily. And at night, they're sort of burnt illegally um, because you're not actually allowed to dispose them in waste systems. They're just too heavy. And so we were trying to figure out how to bind components of the husk um, to give a, a number of different products from insulation all the way to stuff like oak. And one of the ways that we were able to experiment with how strong or how thermally acoustic or um, mechanically efficient these boards could be, um, we started looking at fungal mycelium among other types of bio glues. Um, another was soy, which came from a company in Ithaca. Upstate New York has such a rich um, community of people working with bioadhesives. And in Ghana, we were working with the actual pith. So it's the, when you, sh when you break apart the coconut husk, you get this, the fibers and this dust that we found out was a very efficient bioadhesive as well. And I wanted to show this photo because um, this panel was one of our first prototypes um, that was pressed with coconut and soy on the exterior. 
And on the interior was actually one of Ecovative's earlier substrate, which was corn and mycelium was fed to fungal mycelium. And so what we had in that first prototype was a compromise and a collaboration between um, different types of agricultural waste and fungal mycelium. Um, initially, when we had pressed this and it was fully made out of coconut, it was just such a heavy panel, incredibly heavy, was really bad at absorbing sound. And so the mycelium and the corn in there gave a much lighter panel, really helped us deal with thermal and acoustic absorption. Um, and so it's one of the, one of my favorite projects and till this day, I'm still learning a lot from it. Um, and we also sort of from the module scale, you know, sort of um, displayed it in Ghana in a contemporary arts festival. And it was really interesting to engage with a wider audience from workers, carpenters, welders, people who had no idea that you could take this waste and actually form a very robust building material. Um, in contexts like Ghana, it's incredibly challenging to work with anything natural or bio-based because everybody wants something like concrete, glass, and steel that's gonna last for a long time. So it's very challenging to change people's social perceptions around these materials. And um, from that initial encounter with mycelium, um, to me, mycelium was really interesting technology to overcome what I thought were the failures of the coconut um, boards and, and, and technology, mainly because you required energy and lots of it to control the temperature and pressures to get a product like this. And what was interesting about mycelium was the fact that this could be done, as you guys will find out today, at room temperature by covering it up and giving the mycelium enough moisture in there. Um, and by using agricultural waste. And so I was very interested in, in actually working with this tech, um, species to, to think about new ways of um, redesigning how we produce materials. And so for me, um, it began in an in art exhibition in Liverpool. And I just wanna show you a few projects um, that will introduce the tile. Um, but the idea that one could, instead of centralizing um, and having really high energy intensive infrastructures for producing materials, that you could do this in a distributed way. You could develop all of the kit of parts that would allow someone to do this in their kitchen or on a community scale or even on site. And so the, that was the premise for this exhibition in Liverpool with the Royal Institute of British Architects where we wanted to actually grow the entire installation in the gallery itself. And so right in the center of the gallery is a grow chamber, which was really scary to do because I, I was just so afraid an infection would happen. Um, and then we actually engaged over 200 um, people for, ranging from the ages of six all the way to um, 70, 80. So a number of urban farmers, people who had been farming in the city ever since um, the culture of um, plots for farming in Liverpool after the world war had you know, taken off. Um, so this is one of our first workshops in an urban farm called Squash Nutrition in Liverpool. And um, in engaging with this grow it yourself workshop technique that Ecovative had developed, we produced trays and Danielle has been a collaborator on these trays. Um, and this hemp sort of waste that you're also going to be using today with mycelium. Um, and we grew this with kids in, in, in the urban farm. Um, what's so interesting about Liverpool is every school actually has land dedicated to farming. Um, so this urban farm is not just on like a dedicated piece of land, but it's distributed in the city through schools. Um, and, you know, we put little components like pieces of wood that would allow our panels to have lips so you could actually fasten them and screw them into a wall very easy. Um, each kid had you know, a tray that and I love the human scale sizes of these trays. One can carry it. It's not too heavy for, even for a child of six. We did this in high schools. Um, we also did this in universities. Um, and then we grew them after they had been inoculated in the trays in the gallery. Um, and the students actually came to actually install it in a tunnel that's actually at the start of the, the gallery itself. So we, we built out that, that sort of entrance tunnel. Um, I actually just rebuilt this tunnel in a, a solo exhibition uh, a couple of weeks ago. 
Um, and so you can see the, the wall more. We never really got really good <laughs> pictures of that tunnel, but this space allows you to see, you know, the tunnel in its, in its full glory. And there's an acoustic piece playing in here, which is, is just really nice because of all the absorptive performance of the, of the panels. Um, and so that exhibition um, sort of activated um, expanding the type of waste that one could feed to fungal mycelium. And I started over the last four years, I've been working with a foundation in, in the south of France called Luma, um, where they have, um, they're quite unique because 60% of France's organic uh, crops are in this region, the Camargue region. And we started to map the, the, the diversity and the richness of agricultural food um, uh, waste. So this began to engage with the, with the food industry because they had a rich economy around collecting food waste that we also were interested in, in seeing how they would fare with building materials. So we grew things like lavender um, uh, or fungal myco boards made out of lavender, olive oil, rosemary, sunflowers, a lot of citric based food waste, which worked really well. And because that opened up a much larger inventory, we were trying to um, deduce a pattern around, could we begin to um, see or lens all of these materials through those two components? the sugar stuff, the cellulose, as well as the lignin, the structural stuff, and predict whether um, a, a specific be able to very well um, with the mycelium. And um, this is also tied back into research at RPI that my students started doing in terms of mechanical testing with different wastes. Um, and much like the coconut project, um, the method of production was so important to us. And so we started to think about both centralized and decentralized bottom-up ways of building using everyday objects. And so the architectural studio, as well as through a collaboration with a food kitchen in, in Arles in, in France, um, we started generating different prototypes. Um, so the first was building um, these sort of cylindrical mycelium blocks um, and very quick ways of assembling simple joinery um, to assemble larger scale structures. And so we built a sort of like this dome structure. I'm gonna admit it wasn't very structurally successful, but for, for good reasons, we figured out how to correct it. <laughs> but um, this is an example of the really simple joints. This is just waste wood from the workshop um, and, um, binding wire um, and all of these little, little multiple um, connections help to transfer the force. The, the issue with the structure I should mention was that we had huge holes because we were trying to have views to the sky, but we sort of realized how that compromised the structure, particularly under a summer where we had intense rain in Troy. Um, but that was sort of a rendering of the structure that went right in front of the green building. Um, we actually flipped that Gustavo, who was teaching the studio over the summer um, for an exhibition in the forest um, in, in the Netherlands this summer. So I just wanted to show a video of that. And so this was like a really large scale inverted mycelium dome um, that um, was shown in the Arnhem forest this summer. Um, you can see it also over here much more clearly. Um, you'll see it's bowing here. And like any public work of art, it's um, meant to engage with the public, but apparently there was a, a, a group of youth that were running away from the police and decided to hide in the structure. <laughs> and so um, uh, it was interesting. I was surprised that the, the structure held actually under the weight of a few people, but um, it was climbed on, on top of, but that's just a video showing people engaging with it. Um, also in Arles, we, and this is quite similar to what you might be doing today, is we had individual panels that would accept other types of objects, also grown by everyday materials or arts or plants, that would infill the spaces between the panels. Um, and so it, this was grown for an, a, a community kitchen called um, the Kitchen Collaborative, um, which has a rich mixture of North African French West African um, residents that use and cook for the community. 
Um, and what we decided to do um, initially was to grow objects that would hold things that needed to be used on tables in the kitchen. But um, over time, and since this took place over the pandemic, they realized the huge issue was um, being able to source and share really interesting species of seeds in the community garden that was literally a few meters away from the kitchen. And so we actually are developing it to become a seed wall, a plant and seed wall um, uh, with ceramic capsules inside. And I thought it'd be interesting to show this um, because um, there's also that opportunity in between the panels that you're growing today to put something that might relate to the exterior neighborhood or environment or programming um, in terms of integrating plants or seeds or art. Um, so that was just installed a couple of weeks ago and we're still building out and sourcing some of the seeds that can be shared um, among those who are involved with the community kitchen. Um, and I kind of wanted to end on an introduction to the tile that you're growing today. Um, the, the pattern of which, the surface texture pattern of which was um, inspired by the movement of um, the cap of a, of a mushroom organism as it's beginning to reach maturity. Um, and so uh, also last week we installed this sort of um, landscape installation called Healing Meadow made out of those panels. Typically they're used in a wall configuration, but we actually put them as a, as a floor landscape plants known to the region um, around Hasselt. Um, and, 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 and plants that we know are, are very close to the human body in terms of healing. Um, so you'll see that over there and you can probably deduce some of the shapes that I was just talking about, particularly around the oyster mushroom specifically. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to end with that. Um, I also know that there are talks going on about what, what could be in between the panels that you're growing today um, and whether that's plants or art, um, it's a wall that's meant to interact with a number of different objects and, and not necessarily be a, a monolith on its own. So I'm very excited to see what you know you guys come up with. Sorry, I also wanna give a big shout out to Danielle Marino who's sitting here, who is gonna be one of the people who is gonna lead, the, a designer who's gonna help us lead the, the workshop. So thank you, Danielle. Um, May, I just wanted to say that, that I loved your presentation. Thank you so much. And I'm wondering, um, are you working with any other products or, or waste products in Ghana besides the coconut husks at this point? And maybe you could just briefly describe some of the, the uh, projects that you're involved in right now. Yeah, um, so the other waste that we've been working on is primarily for water treatment. Um, and, you know, again, you know, in responding to some of the barriers of the social barriers of using these materials, we decided to think about using agricultural waste to treat water because that's such a huge problem. Um, and so we've been working with the waste byproduct of a, a plant called Moringa, it's typically used for tea. Um, and oil, it's, you can find it in Whole Foods. It's just uh, another one of those superfoods, whatever a superfood means. Um, but the waste byproduct is something like a flour. Um, it's like bread flour, but it's when you add it to really toxic water, um, particularly textile waste water that has a lot of dyes and heavy metals. The Moringa press meal is very good at binding all the bad and heavy stuff together and allowing it to settle. So it's a great flocculent. Um, and so we've been using that to, to treat the water coming out of a company's distributed um, cooperative of women um, throughout the country. Um, and they're sort of scaling that project up because they're building a centralized or semi-centralized factory in the Eastern region where a lot of the women um, live. And so being able to scale it up from something that's sort of a home technology to almost like a semi-centralized factory um, is sort of a huge challenge and opportunity that we're, we're engaged with right now. Um, another, you know, byproduct that has been really important 
um, for me to use is Cocoa Pods. Uh, Ghana is one of the world's largest producers of high quality chocolate. Should have been called the Chocolate Coast, not the Gold Coast. But the pods are also um, a waste byproduct that we're also trying to develop for other types of applications. Much like the coconut, they are downcycled prematurely into basically soil substitute media, you know, for hydroponics, for nursing um, saplings of, of crops like rubber. Um, but there is another life we believe that these waste, the husks can live before they're sort of downcycled. Um, and many, many a time, a lot of these wastes have such high water content that to put them or to combust them so early is actually a waste of energy. So there's a sort of life cycle timing that is so important with, with um, you know, working with these materials. Um, so that's some of the wastes. Um, the thing that I've been working on since I left RPI in Ghana has been rice. Um, and rice is such a loaded, um, you know, food in this country because it's it's began to occupy nearly 60% of all plates, like it's substituting so many carbohydrates um, and very nutritious carbohydrates that it's beginning to replace. And most of it is imported. Um, and I, I don't know if you guys know much about rice, but you know, there are two varieties in the world. One's Asian, one's African. And the African cultivars are really, um, we're losing extreme, an extreme rate, the biodiversity, because no one's growing them anymore. Um, so over the summer, we've been sort of working on a, a project that's actually a flood control project, but we sort of made it a Trojan horse for introducing rice back into the urban environment um, because rice loves water and can tolerate you know, high um, levels of water, especially during the rainy season. And so we were able to source 119 cultivars of rice that haven't seen this landscape for the last 200 years. Um, and we're growing them um, on a small scale, obviously, at first, before we deploy them into, into the public um, realm. But for us, that's been you know, around a project around food security, around thinking about how do we also um, expand our understanding of the lives of plants like rice, not just for food, but, you know, for a whole range of other things, or just to simply be, you know, in a public space. Um, so that project is, you know, six weeks in and the rice are thriving, some, some not. We're also realizing all of the problems with water in the city um, in terms of what we, you know, put into it. Um, and how that ends up in our plants. Um, so yeah, just um, some of the things and, and materials that we've been working on here um, include rice as well as um, moringa.